Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Andy Weir is the author of the best-selling novels Artemis and The Martian, upon which the blockbuster Matt Damon film was based. In his latest novel, Project Hail Mary, the protagonist is a sole survivor on a desperate last chance mission, and if he fails, humanity and the Earth itself will perish. Except that right now, he can't even remember his own name, let alone the nature of his assignment or how to complete it. Now let's join our own Abby Wright in conversation with Andy Weir. Hi, Andy. I'm here, of course, with Andy Weir, author of most recently Project Hail Mary. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. So, Andy, anytime I open one of your novels, I know we're starting with a problem, like a a pretty big problem. (laughs) Yep. In The Martian, we've got, of course, Mark Watney, who's stuck on Mars alone. In Artemis, we've got Jazz Bashira, who's presented with this opportunity that she cannot turn down. And Project Hail Mary opens with a big, big problem. So would you tell our listeners a little bit about the problem at the center of your latest novel? Well, the first problem that our protagonist has is he wakes up in a hospital bed with tubes all in him. And... uh, he has no idea he has complete amnesia he has no idea who he is where he is or why he's there and over time i mean yeah yeah i don't want to give too many spoilers but this is pretty early in the book over time he comes to realize he's aboard a spacecraft and then he also comes to realize that he is um responsible for a last ditch effort to save all of humanity so no pressure No pressure. So, Andy, do you enjoy thinking of these sticky situations for your characters to get out of? Like, how do you come up with these otherworldly problems? Like, are you mowing the lawn or something ordinary? (laughs) Um, Usually, you know, usually it starts off with like a non, like an idea unrelated to stories. Like I I generally, I'm not starting off with like, okay, um, here's an idea for a story, yada, yada, yada. I'll be speculating on some weird science thing. And then I will, like, so for The Martian, I was thinking, how could we do a humans to Mars mission? How could we put humans on Mars? And I was thinking, designing a Mars mission in my head, not for fiction purposes, just because I'm that kind of guy. And then as I, you know, realized all the problems that could happen, I thought like, oh, this could make a good book. For Artemis, I started off by thinking, what is humanity's first city that isn't on Earth going to be? You know, where is it going to be? What's it going to be like? How do they build it? Why do they build it? And that led to Artemis. And then um, for uh, Project Hail Mary, I was thinking about, um, at at a core, I was thinking about spacecraft fuel. What what kind of fuel would we need to be able to do interstellar travel? And I thought, well, you'd, you'd need just enormous amounts of energy storage. And then I was thinking, well, you know, how do you do that? And also, uh, PHM, I, uh, between The Martian and Artemis, I was working on another book called Jack, Z-H-E-K, got about 70,000 words into it before I realized that it sucked, and so I shelved it and just put it aside, but there were a few elements of Jack that I thought were, were you know, little diamonds in the rough that I thought I could use, and one of them was this spacecraft fuel. Uh, the idea is that it, it just basically absorbs heat and turns it into mass to store the energy, and then it can uh, release that um, energy as light when it wants. And I started thinking about, like, okay, that's a really cool fuel. If we had that, we could do interstellar travel because that level of fuel density would let you actually, you know, ha- have a ship go to another star eventually, you know. And... Um, then I started thinking of, well, we're, we don't, I mean, that, that would be a hell of a technology. Yeah. And it's like, and I thought, well, what if, what if it was like natural? What if it grew? What if they developed a life form that could do that? And I'm like, what if they didn't develop it? What if it was naturally evolved? And well, where's it going to get that much energy? Well, what if it, what if it lived on stars? Oh, okay. That makes sense. It's like mold that grows on the surface of stars and then uses that enormous energy that it's gathering. You know, why does it gather the energy? Because it needs to spore out and and hit other stars. And it also needs to migrate when it reproduces to get the elements it needs that aren't hydrogen. Um, 
And then I'm like, okay, this is all working out. This is kind of neat. And let's say we, we find some of that or some mission finds some of that. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. It would be really bad if that hit our star. <laughs> then our star would have basically an algae bloom that's consuming a lot of its energy. And then everyone on Earth would die. Well, that sucks. Hmm. And then I thought, like, wait, no, that doesn't suck. That's a story. That's a book. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a that, problem. That unsucks. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so both the Martian and Project Hail Mary are a bit of the ultimate quarantine novels. <laughs> Do you think people are going to relate differently to these books now after we've been in lockdown for over a year? And and did that impact your writing at all of Project Hail Mary? Uh, it definitely didn't impact the writing because I finished it before the before COVID hit. Um, uh, it's just, it spent a long time, so I finished it, well, actually just, I was just finishing it right when COVID news was like, oh, they're having a problem in China. Yes. And um, so I, I finished the first draft in like January of, of 2020, and then we went through a few editing passes, and then it just basically sat there for a long time. COVID shut down a lot of the... Um, uh, printing pipelines and stuff like that and, and so on. But um, so definitely it was not a factor in the writing. Um, <laughs> as for people identifying with it, well, um, hopefully, I mean, it comes out May 4th. Hopefully by then we will have turned a corner on COVID. It feels like, you know, this may be like, hey, replay this interview to see how dumb Andy is, but it feels like we're starting to turn a corner on it, you know? Yeah. It feels like we're starting to get it under control. Vaccinations are on the rise. Some places are reopening a little bit. The uh, cases are going down and down. So it feels good, you know, feels like we're turning a corner. And hope, and hopefully by the time it comes out, um, it won't be like a thing you read in quarantine. It'll just be a thing you read. <laughs> exactly. It'll be a distant memory for us at that time. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. So how is Ryland Grace's situation? He's our protagonist of mm -hmm. Project Hail Mary. How is his situation different than Mark Watney's? Well, um, Mark Watney just wants to survive. Like, he, the stakes of The Martian are a single person's life. Yeah. Um, and he wants to survive, and a lot of people want to help him survive. Ryland Grace is the opposite. He, he is on a mission where it's okay if he dies, but he needs to complete his mission or everyone else on Earth will die. So it's kind of the exact opposite. <laughs> also, um, I am very conscious and very aware of the similarities between the Martian and PHM. We have an isolated scientist far from Earth, you know, doing a lot of problem solving. But And I really didn't want to... Um, hit the same beats again. I didn't want to have a, a, a rerun of any of the stuff from The Martian. And so the problems that Ryland faces are completely different. Um, for instance, he's got plenty of food. <laughs> he's fine on the food. Um, and his ship, um, with a few very minor exceptions and a few things caused by external forces, he his ship works correctly. All of his equipment works. Um, and, and never breaks down and, and does what it's supposed to. Because actually, unlike Mark, who is like stranded on Mars using equipment that's supposed to last for like 30 days and he has to live there for like two years, Grace is on a ship that was made for this purpose. So um, for him, it's not a, a story of him trying to survive. It's much more about like trying to find out find a way to solve this problem that has afflicted our son. Yes, well, and I definitely felt that those stakes were much higher. You know, when you're messing with the sun, you're messing with everything we well, know and hold dear, right? Well, the entire Earth biosphere, basically, <laughs> is the problem, right? I mean, like, all, all the humans will die, and there'd probably be some stuff that survived with a reduced solar output, but it wouldn't, probably wouldn't be us. <laughs> Exactly. And it wouldn't be plants or animals. So you really get the, the gravity of the situation. It's an, it's pun an intended. extinction level event is what's happening. And so Exactly. So Mark Watney was a botanist and Ryland Grace, I love that he's like a junior high school teacher. You yep. have this great way of creating unlikely heroes. Um, <laughs> you know, what do you love about doing that? Well, um, 
the most important thing in any uh, book, is, especially a book that has one single central character, is the reader has to identify with and care about and root for that character. Um, there's no other way around it. You, you, if you don't like the character or you don't, if you don't like the character, you're going to put the book down. Um, if you don't at least empathize with the character, you're also going to put the book down. And if you don't identify with the character, then you, you might read the book and you might enjoy it, but you don't really have that connection. You don't feel like you're imagining yourself in that situation. You're just watching someone else do it. Like, I love watching James Bond movies, you know? I like watching some classy, stylish British secret agent kicking ass and seducing all the beautiful women in the world, but I don't identify with that. I I cannot kick ass. I, 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 I do not get all the ladies throwing themselves at my feet. So I don't I don't identify with James Bond. I don't feel like I'm I'm like him in any way. Whereas some hapless guy who's like kind of you know, in over his head and has no idea and and we later learn not too much spoilers, we later learn he wasn't really the the best candidate for this but events caused him to have to be the one who who, who goes um, um, and and so I think everybody can identify with that everybody identifies with feeling like you're not really qualified to be doing what you're doing you know imposter syndrome everybody everybody can identify with um, feeling like yeah I'm not I'm not the best at this <laughs> well, and one thing I love is that I think uh, if you were a parent in the year 2020 and 2021, you now really understand the power of teachers. And <laughs> yes, just that's how true. valuable teachers uh, are. That's true. My 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 hero is a teacher, and that exactly. that's that's um, well timed, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. Well, one of the things I love that you do, Andy, is you you make your characters sort of underdogs that are trapped in hopeless, hopeless seeming situations, but your books really still have this sense of optimism to them. How do you, how do you manage that? And is it really important to you to imbue that sense of hope throughout your stories? Um, I guess uh, it's funny. It's like people say, Oh, you write such hopeful, uplifting stuff. Well, that's, (laughs) um, how I view humanity, I guess. Um, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I have a very positive view of humanity and human nature. And I, I, I know that a lot of people don't. A, a lot of people think, oh, humanity is scum and it's only you know, this, that, or the other thing that keeps us from completely degenerating into barbarism. But I don't think that's true. I think that, that we are an awesome and amazing people as a as a species and we accomplish incredible things and i also think the future is always better than the past um pick any pick any year then pick another year that's a hundred years earlier and ask yourself which one of those years you'd rather live in i guarantee (laughs) you you'll pick the 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 late the latter year i mean i think we can all agree that 2020 sucked right yeah but i would rather relive 2020 than live in 1920 Yes. So the future is always better than the past. So I have, this is a very long-winded answer, but I have a very positive view of humanity. And I do believe, and in fact, if anything, I think the pandemic proved it rather than anything else, that when we're faced with a serious threat, we really work together. Like, Like this pandemic was a global event and caused a global response. Like, (laughs) and, and, we got together and my God, I mean, we, we, humanity, I like to take credit for things that my entire species does. Um, we um, invented a new kind of vaccine, not just a vaccine, but we invented a new vaccination technology in the course of like, you know, six or seven months to deal with this. And what's cool about it is we now have that technology in the future. You know the, the you know future viruses. We're going to use that, and 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 it's it's much more versatile and stuff like that. And yeah, this is something that cost. I could not imagine the total amount of money that was sunk into 
um, not sunk as in lost, but that was spent on developing uh, COVID vaccines. But it must be in the tens, maybe hundreds of billions range, maybe trillions. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but this is what we do. <laughs> exactly. Well, so Andy, Project Hail Mary definitely goes into this new territory for you and without giving too much away, has a surprising character introduced. What was it like <laughs> writing something that completely new? Uh, it was a lot of fun. I don't know how spoilerific you want to get or if you want to have a here there be spoilers warning. Uh, how, do, how do you want to play it? Let's have... Um, Let's have a little spoilers warning. So Andy, Andy's going to talk about some specific things to Project Hail Mary. So if you haven't yet read it, go read it, come back, listen to this part. This is a significant uh, plot twist in the second act. So um, if you listen to the rest of this, you will be surprised. You will, you will have something really cool spoiled for you. There, now you've been warned. So our hero comes into contact with an intelligent alien species. Um, actually an intelligent, a, a single intelligent alien. Um, the, the skeleton of the book basically is that in order, they notice that, you know, the sun is dimming and they need to do something about it. And they notice that all of the stars in our local area, Alpha Centauri, you know, Sirius and so on, are also dimming, um, except Tau Ceti which is a star that's about 11, 12 light years away. For some reason, Tau Ceti is not dimming, and they don't know why. And they say, like, we, if we can maybe find out what's special about Tau Ceti, then maybe we can save ourselves. Maybe we can reproduce that in our system. So um, they take this, this single-celled organism, which is called astrophage, because it Greek for eats stars, and that's so that's what they call it. And um, they take the astrophage and manage to figure out how to harness its space propulsion um, ability to make a spacecraft. And they, you know, send um, well, actually a crew of three, but only um, one of them survived the coma that they had to be put in for the trip because it took years. Um, uh, and, and so Grace is by himself in the Tau Ceti system, and his job is to figure out why is the star Tau Ceti immune to astrophage. <laughs> and while he's there, almost immediately, he, he runs into a large alien spacecraft, and, uh, it, and, they, and so there's a lot of fun first contact stuff. Uh, it's friendly, and they end up kind of figuring out how to talk to each other, working out a language. They see each other <laughs> for the first time. And the alien, he nicknames Rocky. It's basically a five-legged spider about the size of a, of a large dog, about the size of like a Labrador. Um, uh, and um, it has like uh, rocky protrusions on its all along its uh, skin. It's like armor or something, I, I mean, natural. And so he nicknames him Rocky. Um, and Rocky communicates in, in chords and notes, like whale song kind of. And the two of them work out a language and they work out science. They start with science because that's universal and they start working things out. And he finds out that Rocky is basically on the exact same mission that he is. Rocky's planet is orbiting a star that is also dimming. They also noticed that Tau Ceti isn't dimming. So they also send a mission to Tau Ceti to find out why. And uh, but unfortunately for Rocky, he is the sole survivor. Um, his planet, um, I decided to shake things up a bit. His planet is actually not, it, aside from a few specific areas, is way behind Earth in terms of technology. Um, they are they don't have computers. They don't have uh, uh, they they have very limited amount of space flight. Um, and um, so they were venturing out into the unknown even worse. They didn't, they didn't know about relativity. They didn't know about, you know, the theory of relativity, time dilation. They didn't understand any of that. And they had also never heard of radiation because they live on a planet with an atmosphere that's 29 times as dense as ours. So like no radiation gets to the surface. So their bodies have no resistance to radiation whatsoever. Ours do. And so they went out into space and um, they, uh, you know, the crew basically all died of radiation sickness, except for Rocky, 
who was the ship's engineer, and he uh, spent most of his time near where the fuel is stored, and astrophage absorbs any any electromagnetic radiation that hits it. So he was basically shielded by all the fuel, and so he's a sole survivor. So these two uh, these two people have to uh, they decide to work together to solve the common problem and that's where we get into the meat of the book which is really the story is about a friendship yeah it's a it's a story of friendship these two yeah. are become the become friends <laughs> very it good turns friends. into this buddy comedy it, it is it's a it's a buddy <laughs> flick for sure so what was your research like for this book um, and how did it differ or how did you build on research that you'd done for previous books? Well, um, a lot of relativistic physics and stuff, of course, uh, and that was just fun for me because I'm that kind of dork. Um, a lot of climatology <laughs> because I was like, okay, so there's a lot of climate science out there about global warming and stuff like that. But I'm like, hey, what happens if the sun's output goes down? And that's... You know, not a, not a lot of people have put a lot of thought into that, no. <laughs> you know, and then, but it was fun in, in, in a perverse way to say like, well, um, if the sun's output goes down, then Earth is not getting enough energy. And, but we can use global warming and the greenhouse effect to retain energy. So Earth, while they're building this spacecraft um, to try to save themselves, they're also going out of their way to cause as much greenhouse effect as possible to retain the energy that, that we have. <laughs> exactly. And, and so they're so doing like, there's this poor character who's a, a French climatologist who is tasked with, with finding a way to maximize greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and he's spent his entire life like trying to, you know, do the opposite. Do the opposite, right. He spent, spent his entire life trying to, like, fight climate change and, and stuff like that. And now he has been tasked with doing, like, what can we do to absolutely maximize the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Oh, and he comes up with a pretty good solution. <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> this book was dedicated to John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And you yes. have a very important sort of ship in the book called the Beatles spelled differently of course so yeah. why did you decide to make this tribute to the Fab Four <laughs> well I'm a huge Beatles fan I always have been and um I I I, I just the, the Beatles come up a few in a few places in the book um one of the main things is he has these little uh, so we're in spoiler territory he's it's a one-way trip. It's a suicide mission. Um, and so what he's supposed to do, his job is to, because they, they could not possibly generate enough fuel to send him to Tau Ceti and then send him home. Um, so his job is to find out whatever makes Tau Ceti better and then send back oh, these little ships that are literally about this big, like they're like maybe a meter long, if that. And they're just full of astrophage and their total payload is like five kilograms. And so they can they can get like a five kilogram payload back to Earth. And inside that payload is like a bunch of, you know, USB drives, a, a RAID array, stuff like that with whatever data he found. And he has four of these ships uh, um, for redundancy. So that way he'll send all four with the copies of the same data. And that way only one of them needs to make it back in order for Earth to get the information. But the ships themselves are these bulbous things, mostly full of fuel with like a with like a, a, a propulsion system in the back. And then like this little triangular protrusion up front. That's how it navigates. That's it's basically that's where the computer and the payload is. And it's where the sensors are. So it can figure out where it is based on the stars and navigate and stuff like that. And it looks like a beetle. It, it, it just looks like the, the bug, a beetle. So um, they called it, the, the people who made it called it a beetles, like B-E-E-T-L-E, -E -E, you know. And since there's four of them, they just named the ships John, Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> and so <laughs> that the, those are the, the beetles he has. And I have a bunch of beetles-related Easter eggs yes. um, in, in the book. In They're lots of definitely places. fun to find if you are a fellow fan like Andy. <laughs> yes. 
So I have to ask my final question. Will there be a movie? Uh, well, you never know for sure <laughs> if a movie's going to get green lighted or whatever. But MGM bought the film rights, not optioned, bought. Um, <laughs> and uh, Ryan Gosling is signed on to play the lead, to play Rylan Grace, because, you know, we needed someone with the same initials. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, so he, he signed on to play uh, the lead character. Uh, he likes it. He's also, by the way, a huge Beatles fan, by the way. <laughs> I, oh, I learned. cool. Yeah, oh uh, when Ryan and I were talking. Uh, um, oh, that's so casual. <laughs> that's the weird you world know. I live in. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, because unlike previous, uh, unlike The Martian, I'm actually a producer on this movie. So I'm involved in, in, in the in this stuff my plan is to stay out of the way and let the real producers do their job and not not bother them you and ryan gosling share a love of the beatles he huge love of the beatles to go from matt damon you've got to be like raising the stakes in some way so (laughs) ryan gosling that's exciting news it's a good Um, get (laughs) it's a good get you never know um yeah oh and we have uh phil lord and chris miller um, uh, lined up to direct nice. and uh, we have Drew Goddard working on the screenplay and he's the one who adapted The Martian he did such a great job on that and I said you know you, I'm a producer you know and so I'm like I, I'd like Drew to write the screenplay if he's interested and so we contacted him and he said well I'm swamped with work I'm writing this TV show for Disney and like so I'm busy you know and we said, like, well, how long are you busy? I mean, it's COVID. We're not going to be shooting anything anytime soon. <laughs> exactly. And he's like, well, I, I wouldn't even be able to look at it until at least, like, December, January. And this was back in, you know, June or something. And I'm like, we'll wait. Okay. And he's yeah. like, look, I don't know if I can commit to this, okay? I'm sorry, but I, I just don't know. We sent him a copy of the book. He read it. And then he said, like, I'm in. So <laughs> he loved the book. So... <laughs> Oh, that is such exciting news. Well, thank you so much, Andy, for being with us today. Andy Ah. Weir, author of Project Hail Mary and producer. And and producer in the background, but not not really. I mean, technically, (laughs) you know, but I... I'll I'll let the real producers do the producing and I'll just like stay out of the way. (laughs) Well, we're excited no matter what. This is such a great read and um, it's really, really fun and surprising and heartwarming and um, page turning. So all of those things, for all those reasons, go pick up Project Hail Mary. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.